a new inside star system today. Uh, let's go ahead and just go through and kind of see what happens in it. Last week was our inaugural Idris War Games test, and while that completed earlier this week with many lessons learned, and the ship itself is still awaiting important resource management, maelstrom, multi-crew gameplay work, and more before it'll arrive permanently in the persistent universe, we here at ISC still jumped at the chance. Yeah, there was apparently a lot of stuff that was going on with it. I did not get a chance to get into it, but apparently a lot of controversy over streamers being the main focus of everything of it, which, I mean, to be honest, more the full-time streamers do have more time to be able to get into it, but I can't really say that's the whole reason. Could be wrong, but I really don't think that's the whole thing. To showcase the current artistic progress of the vehicle inside and out, as well as to enlist a few of our oldest friends in providing a sort of director's commentary to the proceedings. Here's how it went. Just a little bit of camera. So, hi, I'm John Brook. I'm Nick Tearsley, part of the art director of 2042 era. And, Your new title. Uh, I've got, I've, I don't even know what I am anymore. <laughs> Shall I say that? Shall I say that? That'd be good. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Nate. I, I've not got a clue what I am anymore. He's the one, go down the, well. one the one beef of the Should we week. do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get it Some in days early. I'm this, other days I'm that. Where do you want to be today, Nate? I don't know what I want to be today. What should I be today? Yeah, I was the art director for the thing. There you go. Do you want me to go first? You can be my bloody guest, <laughs> mate. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name's John Crew. I'm the vehicle art director. Hi, my name's Nate. Uh, I was the vehicle art director. We've been asked today to give you a little director's commentary over the Idris that you will have seen in the PU being fought over recently. So the exterior, this has this had quite a few iterations over time in terms of not the shape, the shape stayed the same, but how like the break up, the materials on it, yeah, the, the, the engine thrust, the thrusters of. Yeah, the shapes remain pretty true. We did make amendments to the exterior to fit the interior in because the number of spaces that we needed for yeah. squadron sort of slowly increased. So it's a very tightly packed capital ship actually can't wait to be able to go in and check this thing out. I'd love to have one, but with my plans and everything, I don't know if my crew and org and everything will ever be big enough for it. Possible, and you never know, I may end up getting one at some point, but still very cool to go in and at least explore it. Yeah. If you look at the original concept, it was quite a thin ship yeah. as well. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it just couldn't fit everything in it. I think my favorite feature from the original one was the hilarious flight of stairs that came down in the middle of the flight oh, deck. Yeah. yeah, I think that was my first fix. Then we're gonna fly into the, uh, the back of it, which is the way most players should normally enter the address. You can go in the front, but that'll be a bit... It's getting dark now, John. Yeah. So there we go. <laughs> in Squadron, there is space for two Gladiuses, Gladi Eye, uh, and there's a space for the Argo and PV at the back, but you can technically fit three ships in here. Yeah, when you first land, you'll sort of notice that the exits for the hangar are generally sort of at a lower level. Uh, one of the things we do a lot of uh, throughout the ship, actually, is just slightly slow. I know I do have the Polaris and everything, and I know you can at least get a Gladius in there. We've seen it, if nothing else, the uh, Scorpion to get in it, too. So there have been a few I've looked at that might fit. I don't know if they actually would or not. Um, Legionnaire is one of them that actually might, and I'm kind of wondering if I might be able to possibly fit a... Um, Zeus in there. Probably be very, very tight. But if you kind of move and adjust it, it is possible on it. But with the size and everything here, I know it does fit that. And with the height, you could probably very easily fit Zeus's or a few other things in here as well if you can get them through all the hangar doors. I don't know if they would necessarily attach with the 
anger itself like they do in other ships and of course like the Gladius would, but it's a thought. Slight changes in elevation, even though you're on the same deck. Um, so. And the general layout um, is fairly symmetrical, I would say. The ship, when it was first put together, was really sort of, I would say, designed from the inside out. So there was a lot of amendments on the exterior to make the interior. You know, interior to me is always king. You spend a lot, more, a lot longer on the interior of the ship. So uh, we sculpted the exterior skin. I think that'd be very, very easy to get lost into wandered around. I know the uh, Starfarer can sometimes be confusing to get in, but this looks kind of crazy. Around that, um, if you were to, to hide that exterior, I mean, there is no breathing room. It is no. like a bit of an engineering masterpiece, to be honest. This is where the uh, MPUV hangs from the ceiling. Skydiving also. Yeah, you go sky I've, I've watched. But if I'm not mistaken, if you buy one of these, you actually get an MPUV with it. So, I mean, hey. They, what, what is it, $30, $40 for MPUV? Good deal. Many people accidentally fall out the bottom of the address in atmosphere, out that hole. So d don't do that. Or if you want to recreate the alien dropship scene, yeah, it's do pretty do cool. The gravity room which was originally upstairs. We had to shift things around through the process again, taking inspiration from, you know, real world scientific areas. That whole room actually closes into its own cylinder. You have to sort of open the door to, to sort of get in and you can close it behind you. It's quite a trip. And for all intents and purposes, unless you're going to your bunk or you're going to uh, very specific areas like the briefing room or the gravity room, which you've just seen there. There are no dead ends. Um, it was it was put together when I was on the ship and it originally sort of designed it. It was very much sort of focused around multiplayer combat uh, at the time. And a, you know, a good multiplayer map is is you've always got options. You've always got at least two options at every every corridor, every yeah, room. You're constantly flowing. Yeah. Around yeah. It. No dead ends. So yeah, as you can see. I actually had yeah, a bug been a lot this morning come through about the uh, writing like on the wall being shorthand. Like boarding parties and oh stuff. So it's spelt in. incorrectly. Oh, exactly. That's not had a lot of room to kind of get intentional through choice. And places yeah. and everything. So we've got the ATC room, which overlooks the hangar, which is obviously very useful for being an ATC. And um, we'll come back later to the other side to see what's in there. There's a lot of decks to the address. Yeah. Yeah, there's the sub deck in the Argo, which you, you know, yeah. you'd have seen or the utility vehicle, I should call it. You've got your main deck. This is the sort of the main symmetrical area. And then through the heart, I would say the center of that sort of floor plan is all of the, I would say, business side of the room. So obviously you've got your mess hall here. It's a chow line. Don't talk about the chow line. It's uh, I hear roast lamb is still uh, on special. Yeah. Yeah. That's an inside joke, by the way. Sleeping quarters. This is for your, your general crew yep. for the ship. The bunks have shutters on them, a bit more privacy. Ship, like it's going to be kind of crazy, I think. Just being Within in built one area, entertainment like, system. Kind of so this is in with all these uh, two players. mirrored, I guess, NPCs solo cabins. Well. Uh, the pilots get their own little area at the end. Which are about to get a little bit bigger, but you didn't hear that from me. So the, uh, the version that you're seeing here is taken from a point in time on Squadron recently, uh, but there are lots of little tweaks that we'll talk about in the future to deliver more of the address. Uh, one of them, the missile room, is a, a big one that's still to come uh, that is not available here at this time. Um, but there's, like Nate said, lots of other little tweaks as we get closer to shipping Squadron that we'll be making. Again, inspirations. With regards to archetype for, for Aegis, it, you know, you can see there's a strong inspiration from some of my favorite 1980s movies through here. I like to see, you know, material break up, introduce tech, you know, textures, uh, leather, where we can do to make it feel a bit softer and more inviting as a, habit a good habitational area should be. And it's different for different ships, right? But when you're designing a capital ship, it kind of needs to tick all of the boxes. From a putting the ship together point of view, everything is modular. So you'll notice probably in the PU now, a lot of these elements uh, are reused in some of the Aegis ships, uh, simply because, you know, we try and put the ships together in a modular fashion. 
and the bigger the ship gets, the more modular it needs to be. You really want to avoid doing too much unique stuff because it will hammer your video memory. Because this was the, I would say it's the first cap. Looks like the medical bay in there actually is going to be pretty extensive too. I uh, couldn't really tell, but it definitely I would say has at least a tier one, maybe two. Couldn't really tell on it, but um, I'll have to research that a little bit more to see. So ship we done? It is the first, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and it was really sort of, you know, genesis of... Um, this was put into production actually around the same time as The Retaliator, um, many, many, many years ago. And it was at that time that we started to establish, you know, a really good understanding of how we want habitational areas to feel uh, and look, uh, feeling being a prominent feature. Engineering, again, um, completely different. You got the technology side of it and the medical side of it. So. They became the sort of like four style guides, I would say, that became the, you know, the springboard for a lot of the other ships to sort of follow on from. Yeah, you, you see a lot of similar stuff in the, the Hammerhead, which actually uses a lot of the, the Idris kit yeah. as well. And different, different areas have their different technical feeling. You'll notice here, when you come in through the center of the, the med bay, for example, um, there are very, very, very little right angles. Um, when you look at the floor plan, for example, it, it generally dollies off at 45 degree angles or 60 degree angles. I, I don't like right angles in, in floor plans. Uh, things need to flow, as you can see there. You're going to get a right angle when you come out of one. There's a door, there's not much you can do about that. But uh, yeah, and it's all interweaved. You'll notice there's lots of windows look outside. There's lots of windows that look back into the hangar. Um, so we're not doing any cheating. Escape pods here. Yeah, right at the front of the ship now. So this is the manned uh, turret at the front, the big one up top, and then lots of escape pods here for everyone that's in the sort of upper front half. If things go sideways and you need to get off the ship, I don't want to the escape pods. Going back down, well, starboard though. side. Have to do the bath sim ahead of port and starboard. Yeah, interesting you mentioned that, John, because um, navigation has been a little bit of an issue. So these corridors that you're running around at the moment, they're going to have a lot more of an injection of colour um, in the future. So you'll have a much better understanding of whether you're going forwards or backwards or whether you're on the left or the right. Which Worth would be noting as well, like, all the spaces that you're seeing are completely undressed. There are, you know, tens of thousands. Being on big ships like that, is, I mean, even like in real life, on like cruise ships and stuff, you can... It's very easily kind of get lost on what direction you're going, what side of the ship you're on. So something like this where you're in game as well, yeah, I can very easily see getting lost. So it's good that they're at least acknowledging that that's a possibility. Thousands of entities that end up on top of what you're seeing for Squadron because it needs to feel more lived in. It needs to tell that story. So it's kind of bare bones seeing it this way, which is kind of strange for me at the moment. Yeah, it, but, it was very strange when we were yeah. getting this ready for the PU to to take off all those layers and yeah. sort of see it in a state that we've not seen. Plus also we're not seeing it with NPCs. Yeah. When you see this with NPCs and you know people walking around, carrying out their duties, engineers doing their things at panels or whatnot, it feels lived in, it feels alive. Um, but you know, hopefully when it goes into the PU, there'll be plenty of people running around anyway, um, which will make it feel very similar for you guys. Hamster balls, you want to get buff, go to the gym. I don't know what we had there originally, opposite the ATC, was it? It was the pilot? It was the pilot ready area, but we moved the pilot ready area down to the same Here's level as the hangar, so, like so you can like get your gear, or maybe scramble out as quickly as possible, like rather it's than the... getting your gear... Run down the flight of stairs? ...falling down two flights yeah. of stairs, um, and then Which sort of hobbling more. into your ship with a broken ankle. Then going further back... We're sort of halfway, three quarters of the way back. Yeah, you got your sort of, I think... The crossover point here. Yeah, you got two crossover points on the hangar. Now you're going to sort of come through, and this is where a lot of the asymmetry comes in, although the, the footprint is sort of similar. You'll come through. On one side, you've got a brig, which is where all the naughty people go, and we have a lot of naughty people in the game. There's a security office in there, and on the opposite side of that is uh, basically the opposite side the of the ship is, is the army, which we'll see in a little bit. Hit backspace to big escape pods, so big shared ones rather than individual pods. There? You might have seen as we've possible? gone around some big so red see if signposted. You could actually lock someone in the brig on the ship. They couldn't get out. I mean, it kind of limited on what they could do until the rest of the crew actually voted to let them out. So. I don't know if that might be a mechanic that might be something that's been thought about, but 
I mean, it's a thought at least. Rooms they I believe have EVA airlocks in them as well as sort of maintenance storage areas, so all signposted so you know in a hurry where to go. Then the main briefing room. Main briefing room again, integral to squadron. This is where you're going to get your mission briefings and so on. It's a big ship. Yeah. There's a lot to it. I say there's a lot crammed in. Yeah. Now, now we're in the opposite side to where the brig was. So this is the armory and shooting range. Quite a bit of inspiration from uh, Robocop. Yeah, as you can probably all tell, I'm a bit of an 80s buff when it comes to the movies. When I had to do things for real, board again, actually just build things, ammo too. it visually makes uh, quite a big difference to me as a, as a, as a visual kind of guy. That uh, firing range area is another one of the areas that has changed around a bit over time because it was, yeah, it was so all, it, an all-in-one. I think it was on the other side as well. Yeah. I think we flipped it. And then we got into the logistics of, you know, what happens if you take your gun away from there? What's going to happen to you as a player? So there was, there was you know, you're not supposed to walk around a military ship with, with a firearm in your hand, basically. So, um, yeah, lots of minor changes there. More for the social experience. So this is a... So like with the player-owned vessels, I, I mean, granted, I'm sure there's going to be some different things going on, but if it's a player owned and you leave there with a gun in your hand, because, I mean, realistically, if you're walking around in a ship in any point in game right now, military or not, you usually will have a gun somewhere close by at hand. So I wonder what they're talking about there kind of implementing, which I know Squadron 42 is going to be different, but in the PU, will they actually have something that will like actually do like that or is it just just kind of an afterthought above the rear of the hangar not all the way at the back uh because it has two lifts that go down to or one lift that goes down to the uh two two yeah there's one, each one, side. there's one each side that connects with the hangar so if you're bringing in um supplies or getting ready to go out on a long long journey into the depths of space you can you know utility vehicle drops the cargo off and you can load up pretty efficiently decontamination area before you get into the, what would be the engine room. Very different feeling like we talked about compared yeah. to the, uh, the rest of the ship. Yeah, it's the thing with Aegis, we, we sort of looked at a lot of real world um, scientific, I would say, you know, hydrogen colliders, nuclear reactors, uh, CERN um, was a big sort of inspiration it's with a lot of the panelling and, and general sort of feel. Group, which uh, and that's continued ship, in, in the gauntlet and um, a lot of the other Aegis ships that you'll, that's wild, you'll see. And then there's a, you have seen them dotted around in all the corridors, but there's a lot of uh, wall sure panels that hold all the components. So whilst we do have some big capital size components like the in the engine room, there's a lot of sort of secondary redundancy with all these extra wall panels dotted around. So if one area of the ship goes down, it's not completely scuppered. You can still route power around. Yeah, it's the interesting thing in the original design document, John, where if life support systems went down on the rear of the ship, there's actually sort of like large bulkheads that close that section of the ship off. Yeah. So the rest of the ship can survive. So again, you know, thinking about sort of multiplayer aspect, um, if you were to That's try and ambush feature, one of these things, especially I think it's going to be quite a lot of fun to be had. Yeah, those bulkheads, I think you, you probably will have seen some of them in the corridors. Uh, as big, we watch big yellow... Orange. Yellowy orange. Yellowy <laughs> orange, okay. The layout as well, the engine room you'll notice is pretty much, if you were boarding the ship from the hangar, pretty much the most well protected room um, of the ship. Um, again, with that multiplayer feeling in mind. I think going off, do you remember Titan mode? Squadron, yeah. uh, not squadron, uh, Battlefield. Yeah. Really just trying to create this sort of layer up, up on layer. Up. Looks like it's got a lot of kind of choke points and everything for like the manning crew not just the crew that's attacking but the ones that are actually manning it there seems to be a lot of good choke points what they're showing here on layer until you get to the engine room to to make that quite difficult to ultimately disable the ship 
like we talked about, there's a lot of flow in the interior, but there are those areas that have very distinct choke points to get to, like the bridge is one. Whilst there is multiple ways to get there, they're quite well defendable. And then the engine room is the other. So those are two, two areas you really don't want people getting to uninvited. Yeah. There's a few ways you can go up to the bridge. Uh, there's obviously this lift, um, but there is also a, a set of staircases either side. I did not know there was a lift so you have there these sort of to get up. Everything tactical stations like at the back, the flanking each side, side down on a lower level from the, the main bridge area. I think the uh, thing I'm, I would say, most proud of on the bridge, um, there's been a lot of rework done, but you'll notice here the view out is pretty spectacular. We removed the, what would be, you know, the cross frame, which went across the front of the, uh, the ship, so you got completely unobstructed views out to space. Um, but it still feels chunky and weighty, uh, which it needs to, which is, you know, a success. So that was a little bit of a director's commentary on the Idris, which hopefully you'll have seen and experienced as part of the event that's been going on in the Persistent Universe recently. And as great as the ship looks in the video and the event, there's, there's still quite a bit of work to do before we can give it to players to have for real. Um, things like resource network, multi-crew gameplay, all these things that make it an actual living, breathing capital ship that you want to run and own. That's, that's pretty much it for now. Yeah, to echo what John said, I um, hope you enjoyed what you saw. Um, you know, still a ways to go um, with regards to sort of delivering, you know, the, the ship as a whole uh, for the PU. But I just want to give a shout out to all the teams that have been involved in working on it. I mean, the list is endless. Artists, designers, concept artists, lighting crew, social design, level design. I mean, it, it's huge. There, there is literally hundreds of people involved in um, delivering such an asset um, to yourselves and, and we really hope with the limited time that you get it that you really enjoy it. Yeah, I'd be surprised if there's people at the company that haven't touched it in some way or form over the years. Yeah. It's, it's such a big part of the uh, experience. So what we learned this week? Well, we learned that the Idris is a delight to behold inside and out. That it's benefited and continues to do so from years of iteration in Squadron 42 that there's still lots to be done beyond the currently fantastic art to bring the gameplay to it that it and its owners deserve. And that when all that is said and done, this is gonna be one heck of an addition to the persistent universe. For inside Jared Huckabee. <laughs> <sighs> oh, oh no. Is this, is this the ship you've been looking for? <laughs> uh... For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. Thanks for letting us share the process of game development with you, and we'll see you all here next week. I Some weeks like you have it. Recording these. I've done Some weeks you don't. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. And the sandworm. Stupid. Well, anyway, that kind of gives a real quick run through to kind of going through. Of course, definitely need the resource network. That's going to be a big one. The like multi crew, especially with that, because that's going to be a huge, huge ship. Um, I don't see how anyone could ever do anything solo with it. It's just going to be too crazy to do anything with. Um, let's switch over here. There we go. I definitely see it being a lot of fun. I do hope one day to be able to get one, if not in game, maybe somehow figure it out how to get it. Like when the limited time sales come up, I seem to miss them all the time. But even if it's the uh, Idris P model, get a K mod or something like that, if I decide to even go that route. But thank you for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. Catch you later.